Nigeria's 1999 constitution in section 14 to C guarantees the involvement of citizens in the governance of their country. In the light of this constitutional framework, citizens have a fundamental role to play in the fight against corruption because they are at the receiving end of its cancerous effects. Our topic today is Citizens' Participation in Anti-Corruption Fight. This is Break It Down. Welcome to Break It Down, where we make matters of policy, societal issues, governance and development easily understood by all. Today we are looking at citizens' participation in anti-corruption fight. And I am with the very beautiful Chioma Kanu. Chioma Kanu is the Executive Director of uh, Mothers and Marginalized Advocacy Centre, MAMA. You're welcome to the show. Hello, Bamoji. Thank you so much uh, once more uh, for inviting me yet again to yeah. break it down to discuss uh, matters of um, national importance. What is the role of the public in fighting corruption? Okay, so um, if we are to talk about the role of the public, we should actually be, because, yeah, they actually have a role to play in fighting corruption. But then again, um, one ought to also talk about a, some kind of legal backing for them because um, it's not just about uh, me opening my mouth to talk about you know, corrupt uh, practices in my place of work, uh, but what will happen to me after I had spoken about uh, you know, corruption in, in, uh, uh, in my place of work. So if I am not getting that legal protection that I deserve, you know, I wouldn't even want to be able to do what I am supposed to do to play down my role, you know, as a citizen, you know, in terms of uh, the fight against corruption. And that brings us to um, uh, the whistleblower protection uh, bill or policy. Okay, that uh, has been in the National Assembly since 2015. Uh, in fact, uh, the Eighth Assembly had to throw it out at some point um, because to uh, because it wasn't uh, assented to after the passage at the National Assembly. And of course, uh, the current Assembly, 29th uh, Assembly, has also picked it up again, but it's still going through a lot of processes. I understand it's still at the first reading. The provisions of uh, the whistleblower protection bill actually protects the whistleblower. Yes. And it is if we have this legal protection, legal backing, you know, for the whistleblower, that, that is when the citizens can actually play their own role, you know, by reporting corruption, exposing corruption in uh, public places. For instance, if you're working in uh, civil service and uh, lots of, uh, uh, misappropriations are going on. If uh, you find yourself in a position where you see all these kind of things happening, it is your duty as a citizen of Nigeria to actually make this known, to protect um, what we have, our common wealth, so that everything won't go into the coffers of one person or a group of persons, so that we can have our roads built, infrastructure available. We can also have schools for our young girls and children. We can have good uh, uh, hospitals, okay? Because when we have um, incessant corruption in the system, um, the, the whole uh, populace is um, deprived of the basic amenities that actually keep life moving in the country. So it's very, very pertinent for citizens to actually take it up. But as you, as I pointed out earlier, they can't actually do much if there is no legal back backing to yeah. protect them we from are, what will come after reporting corruption. Okay, we, you mentioned the whistleblower protection policy, which has been going back and forth and all that. But we also already have the Freedom of Information Act. Has that not been um, also effective? 
uh, from, to, to, your, from your experience? Yeah, from the civil society perspective, um, uh, <laughs> FOI, as we uh, pop, uh, popularly call it, is effective to some extent. You know, it has uh, allowed us to be able to interact. You know, we make requests for um, procurement in, in, uh, to civil service. You know, and also to monitor procurement to some to some level. For instance, the bid opening part of procurement. But it, it doesn't, uh, and of course, it help it helps. Uh, civil society and, of course, other citizens of the country to be able to request and also also get information from civil servants. But that's just about how far uh, we've gotten with uh, freedom of information. And, of course, you cannot say um, that the information you are getting is uh, correct. It could just be a packaged information that is presented to you just to push you off so that you won't come to disturb them in their place of work. They already know that you have that right given to you by the free freedom of information to ask, to make requests for certain documents. So if you come with that, yes, to some extent, yes, uh, the freedom of information is helping. The whistleblower topic, uh, protection bill will be more effective than the FOI. Okay, so um, if we have the whistleblower protection as an act, as a law, um, there's another step because laws can also be dominant. Um, if it's actually not interpreted and uh, implemented, it actually, uh, we haven't really done anything, okay? Because um, it's unfortunate that most of the laws that we have that get passed in the country don't actually get implemented the way uh, we would want it. But uh, for all intent and purpose, I believe that the first step is, first of all, to give us that uh, Whistleblower Protection Act. If we get that act, then we will now worry about whether it's going to be uh, judicially interpreted and whether it's going to work for us. But I believe that we actually need that Whistleblower Protection Act to be passed into law, the bill to be passed into law, first of all. And then we can now, as civil society, as citizens, now push for you know, the interpretation and then, of course, uh, the implementation of the act. And that is when we can, as uh, citizens who actually want to exercise our rights as whistleblowers, you know, can actually do this whistleblowing without recourse to, you know, reprisal or attacks by the uh, people that uh, that we made disclosure of uh, corrupt practices that uh, they put out there. Let's look at a topic again, which is citizens' participation in anti-corruption fight. And uh, the young people of these days will look at youths nowadays. It would seem like they are not, either they are not interested or they have lost interest or they have no hope at all in the system. How can we get them to participate in this uh, all very important fight in anti corruption? Okay, so um, I. I'm talking to you as mother. Um, <laughs> all right. So, as um, I actually beg to differ, because um, in terms of youth not wanting to participate, fine. If you if you had said it like ten years ago, maybe I would have said yes. You know, but the uh, recent uh, happenings in the country, like the NSAS uh, protest, actually shows us that young people are becoming in tune with uh, realities of uh, um, what is going on in the country. There's a whole lot of hardship, you know, brought about by incessant corruption, you know, misappropriation of funds and, and all. So the youths are waking up to this and they are actually um, doing their best to also contribute, even though it's, it's not in a coordinated uh, manner, okay? They utilize their uh, social media platforms to to um, air out their opinions and their views in the there are very little way that you know that they can. This is the question you might not like. <laughs> I want to ask it. Still, are women less corrupt than men? Okay, so it wouldn't even be uh, um, fair to even ask that question in the first instance. Uh, 
one um on what grounds are we comparing the women and the, and the men in terms of corruption we've had more what what, what platform exactly that's yeah. where i'm going now you, you if you've given um equal opportunities to both men and women then you can now ask this question and i'll answer you okay but in a, a, a situation where women don't have uh, the same opportunities as men and maybe uh, one or two of them that have found their way to the top you know and also maybe because of um situations surrounding them they were unable to deliver at some point you will now do a blanket uh, uh, generalization that women might be more corrupt or men might be more no 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 we don't do that it's when there is equity in terms of you know uh, uh placement of both men and women in decision making uh, 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 platforms you know positions then we can now check we can run the test you know if you will and um, scoop up our data and our facts on whether women are less corrupt or why is it that looking at so far looking at the whistleblowers that have been uh, perhaps exposed to the public that we know about there are i don't think there is any woman who has been a whistleblower so far yeah, so it, to me, it still boils down to that positioning. Who are whistleblowers? Where are they? They're okay. Like you are. Fine. They are citizens. And uh, first of all, you also, I, I want to believe that as a whistleblower, the um, institution, the, the government protects you. Your, your identity is actually not supposed to be out there because of reprisal. So I don't know who is checking to know <laughs> uh, the number of women that are whistleblowers and the number of men. I don't think the, that information is, you know, out there for anybody to see because they are protected, okay? So I can't really say um, maybe more women are uh, whistleblowers or, or less women are, are whistleblowers than men. And then aside from that, um, what I said earlier about uh, uh, providing a platform you know, equitable platform for both men and women to thrive, you know, in decision-making positions. Um, is, you know, when you get to that level where you can, you know, sit with those people that can, that, you know, dip their hands into government coffers, okay, and cause corruption to happen, that you will be able to whistleblow. Aha. Uh -huh. So if we don't have women at decision making positions, how do you now expect them to be there or to help you and blow whistle and all that? So all those things should make us to start reasoning. What are we not getting right? What is it that we haven't really, you know, clinched in terms of uh, leadership? And also create more space. Do you know it's only four women? that uh, 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 have been able to secure a uh, 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 deputy governor position in, in this country. Only four women. I've touched it. <laughs> I mean, one, one, we can do a whole lot. We can do a whole lot. So, yeah. Thank you very much for being on the show. I know we could go on. I know now that I've touched that one. Anyway, thanks a lot. Uh, we've had Chio Makan. Executive Director of Mothers and Marginalized Advocacy Center. We're going on a break, but we come back. We'll have our second guest, Dr. Chukudi Victor Odoene. He is the Executive Director of Citizens Agenda. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Trending and current issues. The COVID 19 vaccine is a blessing from my own point of view. The NGOs have a role to play. Government policies. Would you agree that the government is proactive enough? I think they are. The what plan. is your opinion? We need to do more. The training of women goes beyond rhetorics of government and concrete action. NGO welfare programs that directly affect the average Nigerian home and the common man in the language that is easily understood by all. It doesn't matter that the legislative arm and the and should be at logger head to show that there's checks and balances. Yeah, is the checks and balances they ask. Every Wednesday at 6 30 pm on this station. Hey, welcome back to Break It Down. And I have Dr. Chukudi Victor Odoeme. He is the Executive Director of Citizens Agenda and Senior Law Faculty Member, Veritas University, Abuja. 
You're welcome. Thank Please you so much, Willie. Please discussing Rudy. citizens' participation in anti-corruption fight. So let's start from um, maybe you now telling us what corruption is, going back to the basic, because this is break it down. Let's break it down in the language that the person watching right now, the common man can understand. What exactly is corruption? When we say corruption. Okay, um, let, let me sound a bit academic with, uh, academic with my definition of corruption. It doesn't have a specific definition, but there, there, there are certain words you can use to explain what corruption means. First is a dishonest behavior of a person in public office. Dishonest behavior. Sometimes it may be unlawful, sometimes it may not be unlawful, but it's something that the society will look at and say, no, this is not correct. So you find them in no particular form. They have a whole lot of varieties. Maybe you are in a position to disburse funds and you put some in your pocket. You're in a position to use uh, funds for a particular purpose and you divert it for another purpose. You're supposed to carry out some projects in location A and you choose not to do that in location A as agreed by the progenitors of the project. So those things amount to corruption. Let's look at access to information now in fighting corruption. How does this either help or hinder the fight against corruption? Access to information. Access to information should, uh, should be um, a panacea for corruption, and indeed it is. The reason why I say this is that um, when you have access to information, you're able to make assumptions and ask specific questions. You know, if a public officer is supposed to be overseeing a budget of 20 billion, and that budget is supposed to be like, um, you know, where's a um, two-story building or build a market somewhere, if you have the proper information, maybe the name of the contractor, how much the contract was awarded, the, the duration period, and the rest of them. You'll be able to, on your own, even visit the project site and see what is going on to make your own assessment. And based on, based on that, you can be sure that the people who are supposed to execute those projects will be on spot. So access to information is a critical aspect of um, fighting corruption. Let's look at the whistleblower protection policy. That has been back and forth for about five years now. Um, what do you think is uh, is holding it back? Honestly, I, it's difficult to say exactly what is holding it back. But um, speculations, I use the word speculation because I don't think I am aware of any particular research that has been done with some level of credibility as to why that has not happened. But my own hunch, my own imagination from my relationship with the public is that in the Nigerian public, in the Nigerian setting, and not just in Nigeria, because that's what I discovered recently, that it happens in many democracies. What happens is that you find out that there's those people in public office, those people who are supposed to be the ones who will champion these bills and turn them into laws, you know, promote the policies and make sure that they are enforceable, are the ones who are not really commit these offenses that we're talking about. If you look at the definition of the word corruption, we're talking about people in public office. They are the ones who are responsible for you know making these policies, um, promoting them, enforcing them, and if possible, turning them into law so they can have some bit of um, sanction attached to it. So that, to my mind, may be a reason why the bill goes back and forth. When this whole thing started, it was like a gale. It was like a tornado. <laughs> you know, it was like the discussion on the banner in every home, in every office, whistleblowing. Everybody was interested. Everybody was excited. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, there seems to be an apathy. There seems to be a law. There seems to be no interest or low interest. Why is this the case? Yeah, it, it still boils down to what we're saying. You know, for you to blow whistle on corruption, the meaning is that you should have in-depth information about the, about the corruption that is going taking place or has taken place or that will take place. You know, in, in the, the meaning is that you must have some level of affinity with the officer who is doing that. If you are not a member of his kitchen cabinet, you're not a domestic staff, you're not um, related, you don't go to his house, you don't go to his office, you don't monitor his businesses, you won't be able to know what is going on. Even if you're a neighbor, 
and the monies are flowed into the compound and packed in a container right before you. If you are not party to it, you probably will not know. So this affinity between the supposed whistleblower and um, the, the supposed um, corrupt officials is one of the reasons why there's a law in, in the um, activities relating to whistleblowing. Then again, um, the policy has, an, has something that is also counterproductive. You know, as uh, one part of it says that, um, you know, um, if you blow whistle against something that you're party to, for instance, if you are one of those who pack the money, you're an accomplice. So how do you go to blow the whistle? The meaning is that you may not be able to get anything from that project. I, and you may even be prosecuted because the policy says that it doesn't escort the whistleblower from oh, civil really? or, or criminal liabilities. Oh, really? Yes. So if I was party to moving the money, sure. it means I am... You're, part, you're an accomplice before <laughs> the fact or after the fact. <laughs> yeah, so you will not benefit from the whistleblowing. Okay. Yes, you're not going to get any, you're not going to get paid. You're not going to get any accolade. You're not going to get any pat on the back because you are part of the crime. You know, so these are the things that are hampering is um, um, uh, uh, efficacy as a policy. So do you think government should, are they even looking at this, uh, this, I, this part at all? I, I don't is know. Is this what is causing the whole... Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what they're looking at it. I don't know what they're looking at it, but this is what the problem is. So would you say this should just be taken out of that? Yes, I think that should be taken away completely from the from the picture, just like the issue of motive should be taken away completely. Yes. It doesn't matter whether you hate the person or you like the person or you are angry or what. No. Once the information you have provided is concrete, every every um um, which every gain or profit or accolade should come to you. It doesn't matter what the motive is. So also, if you had participated in the crime as part of your duty, if you're a driver and your guest says you should carry this curtain and put it inside my car or take this into a location, it's your duty to do that. And if you remove this kind of list level of people from benefiting from what is due to the whistleblower, you make rubbish of the whole exercise. Uh, would you say those clauses were mischievously added somehow? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> by those who wrote the law. I, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know, but it wouldn't be out of place to say that that could be part of it. So, but if we want it effective, we really, really need to clean it up and remove those angles. Okay. Yeah. And let's look at the anti corruption agencies. Yeah. How effective have they been by your, by your estimation? Estimation. I, I I would score them. I would score them sixty five percent. The reason why I'm saying that is that um, the little result, the little achievements they have made, is outstanding. At least the fear of them keeps the public officer on his toes. So to that extent, they've done very well. But the what you need to look at again before you do an assessment of them is that they are also public servants. They are serving our government. They are government agencies. So there's a limit to what they can do. And they look at um, the, uh, what is it called now? Um, they say it's the body language. They look at the body language of who is in charge, who they are reporting to, or who may influence either the appointment or removal of the principal officers in those places. So they are working under strenuous, tight conditions also. So. And then on the flip side also, the level of corruption is uh, so wide that you don't even know where to start. You know, you, you, if you go all out to catch all the people who are uh, uh, assumed to be corrupt or who are known to be corrupt, you probably burn out quickly. So it's a gradual thing, and I'm sure when the time is right, we'll get it right. Go back to the minimum wage thing, if we're going to really talk about facing corruption and tackling corruption in Nigeria? I mean, one is one of it, but there are several others. You know, one of us, and one of the Obasanjo administration came, he sold off all the houses public servants were occupying. That was very wonderful. Those who had access to it got it and they are settled. But if you, if you place Nigeria side by side by developed countries like the United States, if any other people in the United States do not bother about where to stay, you don't need to own two homes if you're an American citizen. If you live in New York, you're a New Yorker. You own your home, you own everything here. But an African here owns a house in the city and ought to own a house in the village. 
Thank you very much, Doctor. <laughs> Thank you. We will go on and I guess we'll revisit uh, this issue. We'll revisit it again. Because when you say corruption in Nigeria, it just goes on and on. And you wonder why it's not abating. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much for watching uh, Break It Down this week. We discussed citizens' participation in anti-corruption fight. We'll be back same time next week. This is Break It Down. <laughs>